All right, so let's open the index.html file. And what I've got in here, if we read the handout in detail, you'll see that some, there's some items here that we need and some that we don't. Uh, there's number eight. One of, the, one of the lines that confuses people a lot is this, content security policy. This is a special meta tag that basically allows or disallows certain content to run or not. And there is a link that you should follow and read at some point for the full details. What this is saying, it's got default, source, self, data, gap, and then a link. So this is allowing default source content, self-referential content, content with a, with a protocol of data or gap or this specific Google address, gstatic.com. Uh, things that have unsafe evaluation, semicolon, style sheet. So this confusing line here is saying, what can we allow about CSS, which is style? What can we allow or disallow about JavaScript, which is going to be script source? And then in general, what sort of defaults do we have set up? At the moment, all of these defaults are fine. It says here, media source, asterisk, which is everything. Allow all media, basically. Style source. Allow style sheets that are inline. You shouldn't really have inline CSS or inline JavaScript, but here we're saying let's allow inline CSS and then any CSS that is in the uh, block, in the head block in this document itself. So this is a very useful but powerful and kind of confusing uh, line here because any custom JavaScript that we may write inside of the HTML file may not run because we never allowed it on line 8. So we'll leave it as is for the moment, but we will have to refine it later on when we connect to online resources. This is sort of like a whitelist, allowing or disallowing content. The other stuff, okay, car set UTF-8, great, format detection telephone, um, just trust me on that, read the documentation that I wrote, tap highlight, no, we want our app, which is a web project, to behave like an app. So on a website, you can tap and hold to select text. You don't really do that on a real app. So here we're saying tap highlight, no, don't allow to tap and highlight text like a website. It's going to break the illusion that this is an app, not, not a website. We'll see something like that also in the CSS. We've got a variation of the viewport. We've used this viewport before. It's slightly different. Um, I think it mentions one or two extra things than what we did. Uh, I think, we, did we have a maximum scale? Yeah? Uh, minimum scale. So we'll leave that as is. We've got a reference to index CSS. So we've been writing custom code in our own CSS file. Eventually, when we transfer over CBDB from last month to this project, well, we're going to need to copy and paste our CSS code into this one, or put a link to our other CSS file. Just keep in mind there's already a link to a CSS file. Title, which will never show up in the app. The title tag basically gets ignored in the app because there's no title, there's no tab to display. It's not a website anymore, it's an app. So this can be anything because the user really won't see it. There's this div right here that we don't need at all. This is just setting ourselves up for the... Um, we're setting ourselves up for that is device ready, which we don't need that. Our device will be ready once we get past the splash screen. So I'm going to say we don't need this div here at all. Lines 18 to 24, we don't need it, just delete it. And we'll just write my app. Well, our app is called CBDB. We have then references to Cordova library. Leave that. We have a reference to the platform overrides in case we want custom code for iOS, for Android, for Windows. Leave that. And then we've got index.js. All of the code we've been writing last month was in a file called myjs 
index.js. So most likely what we'll do is just copy and paste it out of that other file into this file. So for our index.html, this is all we really need to do here. And I mentioned that here. I explain what it is line by line, and I mention those lines. Right here. Let's jump over to the CSS file. In a CSS folder, CSSJS. What I was about to say before the microphone crashed. Uh, that one thing that Visual Studio does that might be useful is that simply clicking once on a file is sort of like opening it. It opened it like this. When I double-clicked index.html, it opened it on the left. When I single-clicked index.css, it opened it on the right. It's not really open. It's sort of like previewed open, which still lets me edit it and save it. I think it's kind of weird. I don't really like that. I turn it off in my options somewhere. I don't remember where. But keep open. But that's just be aware of that. If you simply click, it opens it always on the top right. When you click once on something, it opens it on the top right as your quick view. And when you double click it, it opens it as your real as a real open file. Let's open index.css, and what we can see there are several lines of CSS that already exist, <coughs> and we're going to remove most of it. The very first line mentions this universal selector, and it's applying transparency to... Uh, it's affecting the transparency of everything. Uh, as I said, our project is a web project, and so some web browsers, the WebKit web browsers, would give us the ability to tap and hold to highlight. Here we're negating that. We're saying uh, if, you, if anyone tries to highlight, make its highlight color transparent. So RGBA, black, with zero transparency, zero, zero opacity, that is. And whatever gets highlighted doesn't look highlighted like a website. So this is just a trick to make it behave like an app instead of a website. There's a couple more vendor prefixes here. WebKit, touch callout none, text adjust size none, user select none. A couple more things that help to preserve the illusion that it's a real app. It is a real app, but it's based on a web project. So it doesn't allow a callout. Again, when you touch it and hold it, you don't get a pop-up like a website. You can We can do that better via jQuery Mobile to make it look more like a real app. So that's deactivated. Text adjustment is also deactivated, and again, selecting text is deactivated. We can reactivate it in a better way later. There's some background colors set up here. Plain old background color, it's some, co some gray. Then we've got a background color linear gradient, a WebKit version, so that's Google Chrome, then an MS linear version, which is, you know, Internet Explorer, and then another variation of WebKit. So a few different ways to put this, this background color. We don't need any of that because we've got our colors and design and such from jQuery Mobile. So we're going to delete that in a moment. Background attachment fix, that's related to that. We don't, we're, not really attach, we're not fixing the background because we're using a different background, jQuery Mobile. A little oddly, we've got a couple of definitions of fonts. Line 21 mentions Helvetica New, but then line 30 mentions Roboto Regular. Which one takes over? Roboto, because it's the last one. It was in order. So we're going to remove line 21 in a moment. Oddly, also, line 22 mentions font sizes, but then it re-mentions font sizes on 31. Both is the same thing, redundant. We'll remove that in a moment. Could this be if you don't have the response data for something in your system? And yes, but... back would ignore the ones that doesn't recognize it and gives you data or doesn't have it. Um, it will try from the last one, first one, doesn't have it, fall back. Doesn't have it, fall back. When all of that is done, then it might go back over here. We, I would have expected it to be combined instead of two lines, but it could be for fallbacks. 
Although these fallbacks are way better than these fallbacks. These are more like web fallbacks. These are app fallbacks because Droid is like the default uh, is the default Android font. Segoer is the default Windows mobile font, and these over here are like the default of uh, iPhone. Actually, Helvetica should be default again. Yeah, so a little weird. We're not going to use them anyway because we've got our own jQuery mobile design. Uh, and our own styles. Text, text transform, make everything uppercase. I don't want that. And these other margins are going to conflict with my jQuery mobile designs. So basically, we're going to cut down our body here very, very short. Um, body tag, we don't, we're going to remove lines 9 through 28. So we don't need that background color. We don't need it all the way down here. Okay, I guess I'm keeping the this plain old definitions, these at least basic built-in device fonts. Oh, there it is, Helvetica, Geneva, Helvetica New. Yeah, so cut down everything between 9 and 28. <coughs> and I would recommend, let's see, did I write it in here? I would recommend that this font, uh, based on uh, the, your own particular project, I would recommend for you to figure out what you like as a size of a font via testing. And I would recommend instead of a pixel value to have some sort of um, proportional value such as 1M. This is a unit that grows and shrinks depending on the particular font. Uh, I don't really believe we've mentioned it before, so we can add a comment here. Font sizes in M units. Can grow, shrink based on device. 12 pixels is 12 pixels, which might not look the best on a smaller device versus a larger device. A proportional type of size like this might look better. It depends on the font, based on the letter M of a particular font. So yeah, around there somewhere, which is often very readable. I often see people doing like 1.1, just a little bit larger for a little bit more readability, because these things are you know, even though they're getting bigger and bigger, they're still smaller than we would like. So via your own testing, you might figure out a size here. 1M is a good starting point. All of this for app we don't need at all, because in our HTML file, we deleted the div that had a class of app. And the purpose of this was to display the Cordova mascot icon in the background of the app. We don't need that anymore. We've got a splash screen, which eventually goes away to show our jQuery mobile project. So all of this about this alignment, we don't need it at all. You can delete all of that. So we're deleting it on instead of commenting it. If you wanted to get all of this back, if you don't close this file, you have a history that goes back hundreds of steps. So if you never close this file, you can undo 57 times to bring it back. Mm -hmm. What you could do also is, I do want that. Well, all of this came from the basic default template. So if I ended up closing this, and I wanted to get that stuff back, you could go through File New, Project, and get it all back, because that has the defaults again at media screen and minimum aspect ratio 1 to 1 and minimum width 400. This is a media query. This is checking a variety of things. It's checking basically for portrait or landscape orientation. If it's not portrait, if it's not landscape, things will happen. And this is what's trying to check if you've, if you've gone into landscape orientation, because it's going to change the position of your graphic, which we deleted on the previous line. So we don't really even need this anymore. We've locked our orientation to portrait. This is superfluous. So I would recommend removing that as well. If your app would be will be set to portrait only, you should remove this media query. 
otherwise use this block to set your styling for landscape so within you know if you if you were going to keep it as portrait or landscape the way I would use it is remove the dot app class because we don't have that anymore and then write all your custom code here to affect your app when it goes landscape we will not ever go landscape so we don't need it <coughs> the rest of the lines these should all be removed if you remove the div in the index HTML file, that div with a class of app, because this is still affecting stuff of that basic devices ready screen. We don't need that anymore at all. This is what was setting up the event, the event listening, the color, the fade, the, all of that. We completely removed it in the index file. So basically everything that follows we don't need at all. We have no more animation to animate. We, we don't need that. So I'm going to remove everything past body. We have the universal selector. You can make a note there if you want. Effects all HTML elements at once. removes the uh, highlight, not removes, hides the highlight color from tap and hold. Quick note here, these are also um, additional uh, tr uh, tricks to hide the uh, highlight <coughs> effect. Basic background color makes sense. And then lastly, uh, a list of the most basic fonts per platform. And they're in that order of uh, Android. These two are Android. Newer generation, original generation Android fonts. These two here are Windows Mobile. And then the next ones are iOS. And then I think at the very end there is Sans Serif. So <coughs> super basic Sans Serif. If your font from Font Squirrel doesn't load up, then it's going to try to load these up. All right, uh, here this was all about the CSS file images folder. Briefly in there, we have an images folder that we will take advantage of later. There's our Cordova mascot icon. We can keep it or not. Probably not. We're not really going to use it. We're using our own graphics. We've already deleted the CSS code that references it, so you might as well delete it. Just select it and press delete on the keyboard or right click and delete. Deleted permanently. If you wanted to get it back, you can create a brand new project and get it again if you want. But we're not going to really use it, so might as well delete it. <coughs> It'll take a moment to delete. If it doesn't seem to respond right away, just wait a moment because it's cleaning the project up. There it is. Next up, we've got the scripts folder. for code that will apply to all platforms, because in theory we could target our project for not only Android apps, but also iPhone, not only Android devices, but also iPhone devices and Windows devices and so forth. If we want code that is universal to everything, we put it in index.js. 
If we want code that will only apply to a particular platform, we use platform override, and then you go read the documentation how platform merges works. In the index.js, we have all of these lines. Let's go look at our index.js file and remove stuff that we don't need and so forth. <coughs> index.js. I would leave that comment there. That's another one that I would recommend you read at some point. There's a little note here also that in your console you can, uh, you can run the reload method to reload it dynamically that way. We've got the immediately invoked function that we were using since last month. Use strict, create, device listener. You can comment that if you want. Waits for the device ready um, event, then runs. It waits for the device ready event from Cordova, basically. Cordova JS. Then runs on device ready function. There's on device ready function. All our Cordova code must be written in here. Anywhere in the on device ready is where you should write that Cordova code. We already have one line here, a couple lines. One Cordova code and one JavaScript. So <coughs> these over here are self explanatory. These are waiting for the app to be paused or resumed, then run those functions, which are down at the bottom. All right, so then we've got all of this stuff here that we don't need. After this to-do, Cordova has been loaded. Perform any initialization, <laughs> etc. We don't need this at all anymore. Because this was creating a variable for a parent element based on the ID device ready. Um, then we've got uh, listening for the class of listening device ready. And then display or not the um, those blocks. So this is stuff we don't need. That was only relevant when we still had the Cordova mascot that said device ready. You remove all of that. And because you're going to lose track of it, end on device ready. Now it used the term on 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 device ready. Obviously, if we call this fn device ready, we have to rewrite our code where necessary. Don't worry about it. But that's on device ready, on pause, on resume. Our project, we want to save all and run it. And then our project will look very sad because we removed all of that special styling and the logo and all of that. But we're doing that to then be able to put our project into it and work with it from last month. But all of this that we leave I would say that's the most minimal code that we need. Then we just need to start integrating our code into the project. And we'll do that in a moment. And we run this. The splash screen should still work. Your icon and all of that should still work. It's loading up. CBDB. Two seconds, loads up, black text, gray background. That's all that I left in my CSS. That's what loaded up.
I've still got the project running. Now, I do see a, a, a quirk that happens sometimes. Did any of you, while your device is running, in your JavaScript console here, do any of you see that ready to rock message? You see it, Mike? Okay. Some people see it and some people don't. I'm not sure why. It's not showing up on mine, but in this JavaScript console, Okay, so that's some output stuff. There's a fail there. I'll mention that in a moment. But this JavaScript console in Visual Studio is where we're going to be looking to see all that, that console output. Uh, sometimes it loads, sometimes it doesn't. I sometimes see that the first JavaScript console log doesn't load until a second time. It's weird. I haven't kind of been able to isolate the issue but it works for a couple of people. So it should say? It should, because what our index.js is saying is as soon as, our, as, soon as, uh, as, soon as we capture uh, device ready, well, we know that the splash screen was hidden. It should have gone to console log ready to log. It should have said this is our console. Some people saw it, some people didn't. So if you don't see it, it's OK. I think we'll be fine. I didn't see mine, but I think we're fine. If you did see it, even better. So this screen here, let's get acclimated a little bit with this console. You can pull it up here. You can filter it. I've got one big scary looking error, and then there's no warnings. And then there's some info items. There is this one, clear on navigate, and clear it out now. Well, the, uh, the big uh, scary error message is this failed to load resource. The server responded with the status of 404 not found. It can't find something, fave icon, which doesn't matter. It's not a website. Fave icon is <coughs> on a website to display up in the tab. Fav, fave icon, fave icon. So I'm going to ignore that. You could put in a fave icon here to placate it and not see that error at all. And that would be in your uh, Solution Explorer, in the root level WW folder, you put a fave icon file. It's not going to bother me, but if it does bother you, you need to put a fave icon file. Other output that we may see that might be value to us, be value of us, for us. If you click on output over here, this is where you can see the NSA looking at you. Because this output is what your cell phone is doing. If you've got a device plugged in, this is giving feedback to Visual Studio that stuff is happening. So even though your phone doesn't look like it's doing anything, it's doing stuff behind the scenes. Checking the antenna strength and the battery level and all of that stuff. The con um, console should be visible as your app is running. Did you do Did you do run? The screen will then shift and show you the JavaScript console. So this output panel here could be useful as well as we debug it, and then definitely the JavaScript console as the app is running. We can set up breakpoints and all that other fun stuff to further debug. We've got the JavaScript here. This is a console like Google Chrome. You can write JavaScript commands here. Maybe it alert hello. I've got a hello pop up box in my app. So I can send JavaScript apps to my connected device while the device is running. I'm going to click OK. Focus goes back. So it doesn't look like it, but that's a little that's a little prompt right there. So for example, I can type prompt enter your name. Try that out. 
while the app is running in the JavaScript console, type the prompt command, prompt it, press enter. You should see a prompt appear on your device. It'd be nice, it'd be, it'd be the icing on the cake if, if it would pop up to suggest to you what, what valid JavaScript you can send. But uh, if you know what you're writing, you can write it, press enter on that, and then it pops up here, enter your name. And I get a native looking pop-up where I can type my name. That's a little box asking for my name. Click OK, that's what I just wrote. Almost pronounce it. So you can send commands to your phone. JavaScript commands. So all of this is happening while I'm still in debug mode. I press the run button or press F5 at the top here, then it's very subtle, but then it shows that I'm, I'm debugging it, I'm running it on a device. I can do breakpoints and all of that. Restart debugging, stop debugging. Once I press stop debug, the screen shifts back to regular editing mode. I lost the connection. This output then changed over here, and I'm back to the editor. So we have a web project that Visual Studio is able to convert to the different platforms. Cordova is behind the scenes. I mention here again that the documentation, cordova.apache.org, has all the answers. And so we will be debugging an Android app on a device or a simulator. Another reason to use the simulator is, well, I have this device, this, this dinky little device to work with, and how does it look like on a tablet? I'm not going to go out and buy a tablet. I don't own a tablet. Well, I can use a simulator that is sort of like the tablet form factor, and I can further install more powerful uh, emulators. So one good thing about using these simulators and uh, emulators is I can do it on a device that I don't actually own to check the form factor dimensions and all of that. Eventually, we will switch this from debug to release, uh, set up a developer's key and all of that, run it as a developer, and send it for release, and then we're going to publish it to a real app store, definitely in part three of the class. So this is the big idea, the big shift now in the class. Based on what we learned last time, we'll integrate it to this project right after the break. Then we'll start to work on it, add more to it. We're going to take what we did last month and make it as a real app. It'll be a real installable app that you'll see in your real device, and then start adding more stuff to it and finish it up and all of that, and create a version 2 and make it send tweets and all that cool stuff and take photos and all that stuff that a real app can do. So it's 8.35, let's take a break until 8.45. When we come back, we'll start to uh, integrate last month's app with last month's project with this month's project.